I am happy that once again you have chosen to join us in our Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again we come asking and you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are, of course, still on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. Our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And we continue to look at the amazing view of the Father's love for all of mankind. Adam and Eve was placed in a perfect garden and they had a perfect harmony with God, each other, the animals, and the environment. They had lots of responsibilities to keep the garden, but they only had one, just one, don't. It's just one thing that they were told don't do. Now, how hard could that be? Turns out it was harder than you might think. Now, I can hear you thinking, that would have been a breeze. That should have been a breeze. I know, right? Put me in a perfect environment without trouble, without stress, conflict, or all of the other ills of life, and then tell me I can stay there forever as long as I don't do just one thing? I am on it. No amount of persuasion will make me break that one rule. But you and I are thinking in terms of what we know of the evil that already exists. We know the struggle, they, but they didn't have that foreknowledge. It's like saying everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. That's because we don't have the foreknowledge. I know we talk about the streets of gold and owning mansions, but the fact remains that we've never been there and we have nothing to compare it to. So for now, we are willing to put up with what we know. Now, on the other hand, the folks that are in heaven would say, if I had known that it was this good, I would not have tried so hard to stay on the earth. Adam and Eve didn't have the experience of good and evil. And if they did, they would have had no problem leaving that one tree alone. So rather than just believing God, they chose instead to believe a lie from the father of lies. As a result, they got kicked out of the garden. But we said, not without hope. God promised that through the seed of the woman, he would send a redeemer. And the Redeemer would return mankind to a relationship with God. Genesis 3 and 15 is the first gospel, the first announcement of a coming Redeemer. That announcement was hope, and the hope was passed on from generation to generation. But to Satan, it was God's declaration of war to which the final results would be his demise. So to start the process of salvation, God stepped into the life of a man named Abram. Genesis 12 and 14 says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your, fi your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, 
all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Wow, 75 years old. Can you imagine picking up and moving at 75? To us, that is too old to be starting over, but not so for God. God controls the time, so he controls the age. He controls everything, so age is not a thing for him. Abram's name is changed to Abraham, meaning father of many nations. So God is working his plan. Abraham had a son and names him Isaac. The promise is passed along to Isaac. Isaac has two sons, but the promise is passed along to only one son, Jacob. Then Jacob has 12 sons that become 12 nations. Can't you see God here is working his plan? The promise is passed on. God chose Judah as the tribe to which the promised seed would come. Again, not because Judah was all that. In fact, if you study Judah, he had lots of issues. But hopefully, you see that God is working his plan despite human failures. And God was working his plan through time and events. So Judah, as I said, is one of Abraham's son, and Judah is the, the one that God chose for the seed to pass through. Judah marries a Canaanite woman and has three sons. He marries, he, he marries the first son to Tamar. And that son is so evil that God took his life before he and Tamar had any children. Then Judah gives uh, his second son to Tamar to have an uh, heir for the deceased brother. And, and that was according to the law, that if, if, if a brother died without an heir, then the living brother would marry the widow and, and their first son would be the heir to the deceased son. So anyway, that son refused to carry through with the act because he didn't want to give his brother an heir. So God took the life of this son as well. Now Judah only has one, la one son left, and, and that son is young. And so he told Tamar to uh, wait for him. And so she did. But after time, she realizing that Judah had no intentions of keeping his promise, Tamar dressed up as a prostitute. And Judah, not recognizing her, engaged with her, and she became pregnant by him. Right about now, if you are saying, whoa, that's in the Bible, you should read your Bible. It's, it's much better reading than the stuff we are used to. But anyway, Tamar has twins, Perez and Zira. And God used the birth of these twins to establish two lines of genealogy in the tribe of Judah. And God chose Perez. The second promise that God gave to Abraham in Genesis 12 and 3 says, And in you are the families of the earth shall be blessed. In, I'm sorry. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This promise would come through the line of Perez, King David, and, and all the kings of Judah would come through the line of Perez. But most important of all, Jesus Christ would come through that line, thus fulfilling the promise that all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When you have time, go back and read the genealogies of Jesus 
in the first chapter of Matthew or the third chapter of Luke. And, and then while you're reading, notice how the line goes to Jesus Christ. It goes through one seed. No matter the number of, uh, of descendants a person may have, God promised was to Abraham and his seed, S-E-E-D. Galatians, the third chapter, verse 16, and this is the NIV. He says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds with an S, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ Jesus. So God is working through people and time to bring about his plan of salvation. In fact, God works through 42 generations to bring about the promised redeemer. 42 generations. And in that, he's dealing with people who originated with Adam and Eve, which means that there's a whole bunch of singing going on. David, in, in Psalms 51 and 5, the New Living Translation says, For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. Then Romans 3 and 23, this is still the uh, New Living Translation, says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standards. So because of sin, which disconnects us from God, we all stand in need of a savior. We need to be saved from our sinful nature. The word save in, West, in Webster means to rescue from danger or possible harm, injury or loss. It implies that something has to be done. It is not passive. If you're rescuing from, it, it's not passive. It's action. It's an action word. David said, from the moment we are conceived, we are sinners. That means that little bundle of joy that we go goo goo ga ga all over is just a little bundle of sin. If we are sinners at conception, surely we are sinners at birth. We are first sinners by nature, meaning that it was passed along in the bloodline. I've learned that if a trait is passed on through the bloodline, all of the exercising and the eating right in the world won't prevent you from getting it. Why? because it's in the bloodline. Now, exercising and eating right will help to control it and, and possibly hold it at bay, from, but it won't get rid of it. The only thing that will rid me of my inherited bloodline is if there was a way that I could somehow empty out my tainted blood and then infuse myself with perfect blood, which is not gonna happen. So we are sinners by nature, just by virtue of being conceived, just being conceived. And then we are sinners by nurture. Uh, we become what we nurture. In other words, uh, the more we practice a thing, the better we get at it. The more we spend uh, doing a thing, we're nurturing it and we become better at it. Even as a baby, we practice singing. Ever seen a baby cry when nothing's wrong? That's the sin in them. As life happens and we grow, we get good at it. We perfect the process of sinning. Then, 
We are sinners by our actions. That's the stuff we do. Next, we are sinners by our attitude. Whether we do it openly or we're more reserved, with it, it, you know, in the manner. Most of us can cop an attitude at a moment's notice. You know, some of us are better at not showing it than others, but we can pretty much cop an attitude at a moment's notice. Then we are sinners by omission. That's the stuff we know to do, but we don't do it. And finally, we are sinners by motives. Now that is the stuff. It could be the stuff we wanted to do, but we're either too scared to do it or we just didn't get around to do it. But but we thought it out. And, 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 and you know, it's the stuff we do and, and we have wrong motives behind it. Now, when you think about a whole lifetime of sinning, there is no way we can make ourselves right with a holy God. Now, if you are one of those people that even after looking at all the ways we are sinners, you say, hmm, none of that applies to me. Then James got you covered. In, in the second chapter of James, the 10th verse, he says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. So that means that you can go however long doing right, but you mess up just one time then you are guilty. So do you see how hopeless we were? In order to get back into a right relationship with God, we had to be perfect. Now, if we are guilty by virtue of just being conceived, then we are doomed with our hope of ever reaching the mark. It's like a dog chasing his tail. He'll never catch it. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because they broke fellowship with God. God made them in his image and in his likeness. Then God declared that everything he had made was very good. Before sin, God fellowshiped with mankind. When they sinned, they messed all that up. And God knew that sinful man could not make things right between himself and God. Therefore, it was up to God to make fellowship with mankind possible again. God's plan of reconciliation started with a man named Abram. And some 42 generations later, Jesus, our Redeemer, arrives on the scene as a baby, born to a virgin in a town called Bethlehem. Well, loved ones, that's all we have for today. Join us again next time as we continue to answer the question, why was it all necessary? Until then, be safe, come back, and see ya.